Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Well, now we're going to turn our attention to the Word of God, and we're going to begin a series today, and that series is taken from the book in Hebrew called Kohelet. You may know it better as Ecclesiastes. And one of the key thoughts in this book is vanity. Now, to understand this book of Ecclesiastes in a proper way, we need to remember the perspective that its author, and we're going to see without any doubt that the author is Malik Shlomo or King Solomon. And Solomon is known for wisdom. God provided him wisdom to rule, but unfortunately, Solomon did not always utilize that wisdom. We know that he did things that showed a doubting of God's provision. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, he entered into marriages to form confederacy, that is, agreements or covenants with nations. And believing that these confederacies, this agreement with other nations, would provide security. That's not wise, because security is found in obedience to God. Now, not only that, we need to realize that Solomon wrote this book as a confession. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Another book that Solomon authored was Shir Hashirim, or the Song of Songs, commonly referred to as the Song of Solomon. And we know that as a love story, but if we read it carefully, what Solomon is saying is this, don't do as I have done. Learn from my failures. Understand what I have done and don't make those same tragic mistakes. Now, in our book, in Ecclesiastes or Kohelet, we find that Solomon, the wisest man ever to live, and one that had tremendous resources, both from a financial standpoint, but also his position as king at his lifetime, he was king over the most powerful empire in the world. And he could have whatever he wanted. And the problem is this, that he at times pursued things not based upon the wisdom of God, not based upon the truth of scriptures, but what his hand found, he won after. He did not restrain himself under the restraint of scriptural truth. And in the same way that he had 300 wives and 700 concubines, and as I said, entered into marriages because of political reasons, would you want that man to give you advice about marriage? Well, if he had learned from his mistakes, from his sin, then he might be able to provide wise counsel. And that's exactly what we find in that book, Shir Hashirim, The Song of Songs. He gives us wisdom about understanding that precious relationship, a covenantal relationship between a man and a woman and the living God. So he writes it as, don't do as I have done, but choose obediently before God what his word reveals. And likewise, in this book of Ecclesiastes, he's saying to us, when we live according to our own thoughts, utilizing our own intellects for the pursuits of our desire, well, what's the key word here? The key word is hevel, which is oftentimes translated vanity. And what Shlomo is telling us is this. When we perceive the th world from our vantage point, based upon our wisdom, and Solomon, he had more wisdom from an earthly standpoint than anyone else. 
And he had power, prestige. He had the ability, whatever he wanted, to ascertain that. And what he's telling us is that it did not bring him joy. Here's the message. When you achieve all of your goals, now think for a moment. Are you king? Do you have a, a unlimited resource of finances and power? Do you have an empire behind you to ascertain for you whatever you want? And obviously the answer is no, I don't. Solomon did. And he demonstrated no restraint. He got everything that he wanted. And what did he say? It's vanity. It did not satisfy him. So if you can achieve being king over the strongest empire in the world, if you can have greater intellect and knowledge than anyone else, and you have great wealth and resources, and people submissive to you, whatever you say, they were willing to die for you. If you have all of that at your disposal, but nevertheless do not find joy, happiness, and contentment, it's all vanity. What's left for you? What can you pursue? Well, that's exactly the answer that Solomon's going to give us at the end of this book. Now, what we're going to do is go through the book of Kohelet, or Ecclesiastes, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, word by word. And we're going to see that there is an apparent uh, repetition in things, and that's okay. Because what we're going to see is that God is going to chip away at that hard heart that we have, that stubborn quality that is nature for every human and it's when we hear sometimes the same things over and over it begins to penetrate it sinks in so that we can understand god's revelation and apply it to our life well without any more said look with me to this book of ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 1. this is what we read the words of kohelet now, we need to talk a little bit about that word Kohelet. Now, many people say it means the preacher. Well, the word comes from a Hebrew word which has to do with an assembly coming together. Now, in English, Ecclesiastes comes from a Greek word which means to be called out. It is the same Greek word where we get the word church. But here it's speaking about those who are called out by God, called out with a purpose, and they come together, they assemble to fulfill the will of God. And that's important because here Kohelet, that is Solomon, he was the leader of Israel. He was supposed to be bringing unity under submissiveness to God's plan, his purposes. And what we're going to find is that he wasn't about that for much of his life. And that's tragic. You know, most people, they waste more time than they utilize for right things. We oftentimes spend a lifetime doing the pursuits of our flesh rather than listening to the Spirit of God and being led by Him into obedience to His will. Because it's only when you are living in his will and obeying his will are you going to have that joy that you're truly seeking. The one that you were made for and to experience that is only going to bring contentment into your life. And that's what this book in the end is going to teach us. So look again at verse 1. The words of Kohelet, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, do we really know that this is Solomon? Well, a little bit later on, we're going to read a verse, and I'm going to read it not only later on, but I'm going to jump to it right now so we can put the authorship to rest, that we can know for sure who wrote this book. If you look at this scripture in verse 12, you're going to see something very important because it says, Ani Kohelet, that means I am the Kohelet, 
the same one that it says this book is the words of Kohelet. And he says, I was king over Israel in Jerusalem. And that fact tells us a great deal. You see, after Solomon, the empire was divided. There was only two kings that could say that they were king in Jerusalem over Israel. And that was David and David's son, Solomon. Well, we have already have discovered in verse 1, it says, Divrei Kohelet ben David, the words of Kohelet, the son of David. So the fact that it's a son of David mean it can't be King David himself. And the only other individual who is a son of David, who ruled from Jerusalem over Israel, that means a united kingdom, was Solomon. So we know without any fact or any doubt whatsoever that this book was written by Malach Shlomo, King Solomon. Let's go back to verse 1. The words of Kohelet, the son of David, the king in Jerusalem, now verse 2. We're going to see five times this word hevel appears in this second verse. And the word means vanity. Notice what he says. Vanity of vanities, says Kohelet. Vanities of vanity. Everything is vanity. Now, what is this word hevel in Hebrew? We translate it vanity, but if we pay close attention to it, it means a vapor. James speaks about what is our life but a vapor. I mean, you see it and it just kind of evaporates in 70, 80 years if you're fortunate. Now, this word is also used in modern Hebrew for a type of vapor, but if you've ever been on a hot day and you see the, the asphalt and there'll be kind of a... Uh, uh, smoke rising from it you see it from a distance and it's there for a moment and then it just kind of disappears and that's what solomon is saying about life and here's the key when you understand all that's in this book what solomon is saying is this when you live a life that's based upon the pursuits of yourself based upon your own human intellect your own wisdom when you pursue life in that way, your life is vanity because it's going to be here today and gone tomorrow. So he's writing here from that perspective. Move on to verse 3. He says, you know, what advantage is there to a man in all the labor that he labors? Now, some translations use two different words, but in Hebrew, it's the same word. It means toil or labor. So he asks a question, what advantage is there to a man in all of his labor, which he labors, tachat hashemesh? Now that means under the sun. Now this expression, under the sun, is important especially in this first chapter. You would think that he would write under the heavens, and later on he's going to. But these two terms, tachat hashemesh ve tachat hashemaim, under the sun and under the heavens, are very important. Why? Because it shows us, at least in this first chapter, two perspectives. Whether he's speaking from a human standpoint, you see, for mankind that does not know the truth of God, well, if you look historically, there was a... a affection between humanity and the sun for for many many uh generations people worship the sun they were in darkness even though they worship this great light and solomon when he says tachat hashemesh he's talking about a worldly perspective he's saying there's no advantage to all the labor which i labor for form a human or a natural perspective what he can discern in and of himself move on to verse 4 he says generation comes and generations go 
and the earth forever stands or remains. So he's looking at it this way. You know, a man comes, he lives, and he dies. His son lives and dies. His grandchild, these many generations go. And what happens? Well, when we look at the earth, not month has really changed. Meaning a single individual doesn't make much of an impact upon the world. The world seems to be unchanging. Now, it may go through cycles. There may be a little change here and a little change there. But over long periods of time, those same mountains that stood 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, they're still there. And that ocean that bordered us on the west is still there. And that one on the east, it's still there. So man lives, but he doesn't impact, he doesn't bring much change into the world. So with that thought, what really is the sum total of our life? Now you can see why he has this idea of vanity, that nothing really amounts to anything. Look now to verse 5. Not just talking about the earth, but in verse 5 he mentions the sun again. The sun shines and the sun... Uh, goes away so it rises and it sets and then it says to its place and the word here is the word show f it means desire or aspiration a strong passion now many bibles simply means runs so to its place it runs or it has aspirations why well the sun rises and it shines and then it sets and then it goes quickly back to its place where it begins the next day. And it says from there, it also shines. So there's this cycle. See, you can do almost anything that you want. And what happens? Well, whatever it might be, you know what? The sun rose today and is going to rise tomorrow. You're not going to alter this pattern, this order, this, this, this cycle that God has established. Furthermore, he says, look at verse 6. And it's very important in verse 6 that we understand that the subject is the ruach or the wind. Now, that same word can be translated spirit, but it's here, it's very clear. We're talking about the wind. And in this second half of chapter 1 of this book of Kohelet, we're going to see that the wind plays a significant role in a literary standpoint for conveying to us what Solomon wants to teach us. So look again at verse 6, the subject, the wind. The wind goes to the south and it turns to the north. It goes, that is the wind goes around about and on its uh, journeys, and the word here is another word for going around. It goes around and we see something else. It returns, that is the wind goes back to where it came from. So the same fruitless cycle. It blows to the south, it goes to the north, it goes on its cycles, and it comes back to where it originated from. So once again, nothing seems to change. And what frustrates Solomon is that he's not having much of an impact on this world. Now, the point that's so vital is, who set things in motion? God did. And things are going in a normal course. But here's the problem. It's only when we base it upon our intellect, our perspective, how we see things, and we don't see things from God's perspective. The only way, and here's a key, the only way that we can have God's perspective is when we learn things from his word. It's only through his scripture that we can develop the mind of Messiah, that we can know things from a kingdom perspective. Now, there's a verse that comes into my mind about the last days. Now, oftentimes, I'm accused of always trying to work into every message something about the last days. And the reason for that is that I'm passionate about the kingdom of God. And the last days, the end times, well, they are that transition 
from this age into the kingdom. And if we are kingdom-minded, we're going to want to understand those last days in order to position ourselves where we can be of greater value to God, usefulness, being those, those instruments of revelation to bring more and more people into the kingdom. That's our primary responsibility as his servants in this world. And people scoff concerning the last days and the coming of Messiah. And what do they say? They say that the earth, you know, everything's the same since the beginning of time. And that is that they have a very, very short-term mindset. God says that this world's going to endure, but in the end, it's going to come to a very quick change. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look at the book of Revelation, a very important word, especially towards the end of the book of Revelation, when we begin to speak about the end, and a new beginning, the kingdom of God, is that word soon. Now, that word soon doesn't mean soon as in tomorrow or the next day or in a very short amount of time. Really, that word would be better translated quickly. And here's the key. When God brings about the end, it's going to happen very quickly. Meaning, if we're not prepared, if we are not looking at prophetic indicators, well, we're going to miss out on what's happening and we won't be ready. So there is going to be change in this world, but it's going to happen rapidly at the end. And if we're not perceptive, if we're not seeing things from a prophetic standpoint, we're going to miss out. So Solomon now is writing and he's looking at creation. He's looking at this world, and he says, you know, the earth was here yesterday, the day before that, a year before that, 10 years before that, and really nothing's changing. And he's right. It's not going to change until the last days. Well, move on, if you would, to verse 7. He's going to talk about the rivers. He says in verse 7, and all the rivers go to the sea, and the sea is not full. So he says, you know, this doesn't make sense. If all the rivers go into the seas, why don't the seas become full? And he says, and to the place that the rivers go there, they also return. Meaning what? Well, there's a source for most rivers. And what we find, in fact, living in Israel one of the most important rivers is the Jordan River. And there's three rivers that feed into it. And one of the main or primary source is the Banyas River. And you can go to the place, it's at Caesarea Philippi, and see the water come out from the ground. And what do we know? It doesn't run out. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. And what is Solomon saying? He says it pours out. It streams away, but it just keeps coming back. If the rivers pour into the sea, and then apparently if it doesn't fill up, they give it back to where it's coming. So he sees futility in this, that nothing ever changes. Well, here's the problem. When we believe that there's never going to be any change, you know what we're saying? We don't believe in the kingdom of God. Because when we look at, once more, the book of Revelation. And we see a description of the kingdom. It says, behold, all things are new. And that word new means different. There is a change. It's coming. But if we simply look at nature to be the source of revelation, well, we're going to be misled. And that's what this scripture is trying to tell us. Look now to verse 8. He says here, And all things are wearisome. What he's trying to teach us here is that when he looks at all things, he doesn't see anything which comforts him. Why? Because the more he learns about it, the less that he knows. And we're going to see that very clearly revealed to us towards the end of this chapter. So he says as he pursues things, 
it's wearisome, it's tiresome. Why? Because a man is not able to speak, meaning he can't give a summation of anything. Meaning, the more he thinks he knows about something, you know what he arrives at? That he really knows very little about it. And likewise, he says here, because the eye is not satisfied by seeing, nor is the ear full from hearing. Meaning, we see something, and it leads us to want to discover more. We hear something, and we want to hear more about it. We never come to an end. And here's the why he sense a futility or everything's vain and in vanity. Why? Because he doesn't see an end. He can't arrive at a conclusion of a matter. Because nature doesn't bring a conclusion. But nature will come to an end. It is going to be transformed. See, to understand this book of Ecclesiastes, you need to understand that there is a kingdom coming. And it's only in that kingdom that you're going to find satisfaction, that you're going to arrive at a proper understanding. It's through the kingdom that gives us a perspective for understanding this world and realizing that we want to come out of this world. We're not called to be successful in this world from a worldly standpoint. We're not called to be knowing everything about this world. No, we want to know and focus in on the kingdom of God. Move now to verse 9. He says this, What was will also be. So he's saying, you know, what was is simply going to return. He's focusing over and over on these cycles. And what was, he says, will be. And here he's talking about not simply anything, but he uses two different words. What was, will be, and what was made, will, will be made. So he's talking about how things simply repeat itself. He says, there is nothing new under the heaven. Or here it says, under the sun. Now, this expression, let's look at it again. He says, En kol chadash tachat hashemesh. There is nothing new under the sun. Now, that word new is very important. I've shared with you. In the scripture, whenever we come across that word new, what should come into our mind is kingdom. And what Solomon is saying, and this is what the Hasidim teach, Solomon is looking at this world and he doesn't see any evidence of anything new, meaning he doesn't see any evidence of the kingdom of God here in nature. And for the most part, that's true. What do we learn from the Apostle Paul? Well, Paul teaches us this, that from nature, from creation, all we can know is this, that there is a creator. And this creator is a God of order because he put order into this world. This world that we live in is not chaos. God, through his word, brought order into his creation. Now, sin has uh, disrupted that, and we see disorder because this world has been stained with sin. But here's the point. It is only through God's revelation, his word, that we can derive that there's going to be a new work. And what is that new work? Kingdom. So here again, we need to review and understand something. What God is saying is this to Solomon. If you simply look as nature for the source of revelation, you are going to become frustrated, you are not going to have hope, and you're not going to have anything in regard to a right understanding of the kingdom of God. And that's why when we pursue the knowledge of this world, when we believe that this earth and this creation has all the answers, and if we study and study and study, that we can find the solution to all the problems that plague mankind, well, we're sadly mistaken. Because the more we know about this creation, 
the more we realize we don't understand. So Solomon is saying here, look again at the end of verse 9. And kol chadash tachat hashemesh. There is nothing new under the sun. Here again, that phrase, under the sun, he's talking about it from a very humanistic point of view. Look now to verse 10. He says here, Yesh devar sheyomar ra'eze chadash. There is a thing that they said, look, this is new. But in actuality, he says, hu kavar haya leolamim. This was already was in, and they use this word olamim, meaning in different times. You know, it was, and we just forgot it. We didn't realize it. We may not have experienced it. But what we're finding is what was is again. And what we thought wasn't, well, it was. Now, people will always say, always say, well, what about technology? I mean, aren't we seeing new things invented? Well, we're seeing new ways invented, but not new things. Let me give you an example. Think about the smartphone. People look at the smartphone and say, now, there's something that is totally new. Well, what can you do with that phone? Well, you can be, for example, in uh, Jerusalem, and you can talk to someone in India. And just face-to-face, -face, on the screen, hear perfectly, see them. Well, you couldn't do that. That's something new, is it not? Well, the truth is this. There's always been communication. Now, it might take longer. It might be a different way. But people have communicated from the beginning of time. We just have a new way of doing communication. That's all. But it's a new way to achieve the same old goal. That's what he's saying here. And doctors, there's great medical advances. Yes, there is. But here's the point. We've always wanted, what? People to be healed. And people would have problems. They would get hurt. And they found ways to do what? Bring healing, brain restoration, to cure things, whether it was a broken bone or a cut or a burnt, a burn, they did so. But here's what I want you to see. The doctors today, can they stop death? No, they may be able to prolong it for a while, but death will find it out. So doctors treat problems, they always have. You may say they do it more efficiently today, that may be true. But they're doing the same things, maybe simply a different way. They're trying to prolong life. They're trying to bring healing. They're trying to eliminate suffering. But is that new? They've always been doing that. And in the end, they're going to fail because their patient will die. The first thing that I've been told that people learn at medical school is this. The patient will eventually die or you'll die before your patient. But doctors cannot stop death. Nothing's new about that. Well, look, if you would, to verse 11. Here's something that we need to realize. En zecharon le'rishonim. It says, there is no memory of the former things, and that can be the former generations or former people, and also the latter ones. What does he mean by that? Well, the ones who were before us, we forget. And the latter ones, that in our age, well, they will be also forgotten, right? Because they will become the latter ones again. So what he's saying here is this. There's the early generation, and they're going to be forgotten by the latter generation. And that latter generation, in the end, is going to be a former generation. And in the end... Everyone is going to be forgotten. There is no zikharon perfect. Everything gets forgotten sooner or later. So he's saying it's senseless. You may want to make your mark in this world, but whatever you do, eventually it's going to be forgotten. Tonight at our study center here in Israel, before I gave a lecture, we have our friend, many of you know him, Michael. And Michael gives the Parshat HaShavua. And he was talking in this week about 
Parshat Shemot. Now, Parshat Shemot, that Torah portion, you'll say is next week, that's right. But we read it beginning on Shabbat in the afternoon for the previous Torah portion that we'll read this coming Shabbat. So in the book of Exodus, he was talking about the verse that says, there arose a king in Egypt that did not know Joseph. Now just think for a moment. Joseph was the savior of Egypt in this time of devastation and destruction because of the famine. The world was being destroyed, but because of Joseph, he saved Egypt from destruction. He prepared for it, and he caused Pharaoh to become even more wealthier because he sold the food, he sold it at the right time in the right way, and he purchased everything from the people. In fact, he brought the world into bondage for Pharaoh. I mean, you would think that of all the people who ever stepped foot in Egypt, that Joseph would be the one that the kings of Egypt would remember because he provided them great wealth. He caused their dynasty to remain. And what do we find here? Joseph was also forgotten. So no matter what you achieve, you're going to be forgotten. Sooner or later, no one's going to know your name. But that's why it's so important that your name be inscribed in the Lamb's book of life. Because God won't forgive you, forget you. He is going to acknowledge you in his kingdom. And he will know you for eternity. Because in the kingdom, there is a, a not a ending, but a perpetual beginning. And therefore, we read in this age, everything's coming to an end. It's going to be forgotten. Now look, if you would, to verse 12. Now, in verse 12, if you're looking at a Hebrew Bible, and most of you probably are not, some of you have an English Bible with Hebrew as well. And if you look between these two verses, the end of verse 11 and the beginning of verse 12, you're going to find that there's a space there that doesn't appear between other verses. It doesn't appear in the English Bible, but in the Hebrew Bible it does. And why? Well, because we're beginning a new transition in this chapter. Why do I say this? Well, it goes back to something very similar as we saw in verse 1. Look at it, verse, verse 12. And I, Kohelet, I was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Now, we read that earlier, but it's a repetition. It is very similar to what we read in verse 1. The words of Kohelet, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Well, now we have, he was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Similar, but different. And why the difference? Well, look at the next verse. Notice what it says here. He says, and I gave my heart to seek and to search. Now that word for search is a word for today for being a tourist or, or being a, a person that investigates. When you tour, when you're a tourist, you're there to see new things. So that's why it appears in the ancient Hebrew. So he says, I gave my heart to search and to seek wisdom over all which was done under, and it's a change, lo tachat hashemesh, but here it says tachat hashemayim under the heavens and that change in word is very significant why is that because now he's going to look at things partially from a religious or spiritual standpoint but here's the problem notice what he says concerning this look again verse verse 13 and i gave my heart to to search and to seek for wisdom over all which was done under the heavens. And he says, this is an evil matter. It's the word ra. And ra means uh, that which is not pleasing. That which is what? 
voice says, this is a inyan ra. Now, usually when we come across that word, we think of something which is against God's will. And if we are under the impression that God wants us to understand more than anything else all the things that are done in this world, well, we are missing out on his will. See, our pursuit should not be a knowledge of this world, but a knowledge of the creator of this world. And so he tells us here in this expression that when we seek things that are outside of his will, when we want to know and we put our heart not to know God, but to know what's done under the heavens. Well, what does he say? He says, this God has given to the sons of man to, literally, now your Bible will say something different perhaps, but it's the word la not bo. The word la not, well, it can be to answer, but in this construction, it means to afflict or torture. So what it says is this, when God sees someone whose his pursuit is simply knowing knowledge without knowing God, that person is going to be afflicted inwardly from a spiritual standpoint. That's the context with the change, that space between verses 11 and 12. What we read at the end of verse, verse 13 about under the heavens, it's to tell us that God is part of this equation. And when we leave him out, well, it's going to be what? It's going to be very burdensome. It's going to be an affliction. It's going to be spiritual torture. Now move on to verse 14. He says here, And I saw all the works that were done underneath the sun. So now he's back saying, you know what? If, if I'm not going to find success, from a spiritual standpoint, when I look at this world from a what? Well, from the position of heaven, looking down. Well, here again, we're not supposed to understand this world. That's not our pursuit. We're supposed to understand and seek knowledge of God. And it's only when we know God are we going to be able to see this world from his perspective. And it's going to have relevance, meaning we're going to be able to utilize things here for, and here's the key, for a kingdom purpose. So once again, verse 14. I looked at all the deeds that were done underneath the sun, and behold, everything, there's that same word, hevel, is vanity. And then he uses a phrase, and this is going to be very important twice. He uses a similar phrase. Here it is, reut ruach. Now, some will say that this is chasing the wind. It's futility like chasing after the wind. And I would agree chasing the wind is futility. But the word here, ra'ut, it can be from the same word that we get uh, animals feeding. So it could be feeding from the wind. Imagine this. If you're hungry and you start eating wind, are you going to have any substance to that? No, you're not. It's futile. But it can also be, that same word can be friendship. And it's like having a friend that's the wind. He's not going to listen to you. He's not going to be able to respond to you. He's not going to offer any companionship. So it could be translating it that way. But either way, it's futility to pursue the wind, to chase after it, to eat it, to, to converse with it. There's no no substance to it. Look now to verse 15. He says here, Me uvat lo yuchal litkon. Now, that word, me uvat, it's a word for perhaps twisting something or distorting something. And he says, that which is distorted, it can't be fixed. Now, you might say, well, certainly it can. But here's the problem. The Hasidim give an example of this passage of Scripture. And they give the word here in Hebrew. It's very interesting. It's tzalakat, which is a scar. Now, why is that important? Because it might heal, but you have an evidence. It's not the same. When something is broken, you might be able to glue it back together, 
but there's that same scar, that same evidence. You might camouflage it, but it's there. Once broken, once distorted, it can't be put back exactly as it was. There's always evidence of that. Now, this has a lot of implications to it because many people, they believe that sometimes their failures are what? Well, they were God's will. There is theology that distorts the sovereignty of God. It twists it. It gives a wrong understanding of it. It also takes the biblical word that's translated predestination and applies it to things that ought not apply it to. And what happens, they come away with a theology that whatever happens, well, it wouldn't have happened because God's sovereign, therefore he must have wanted it to be, and he can turn it into good. Well, God can take that which is bad and turn it into good for those that love him and are working according to his purpose. But here's the problem. God's kingdom are not best advanced by disobedience. People want to speak, and since we're going to be coming into the book of Exodus, let me give you an example. There are those who want to say it was God's will that, that Joseph was sold into slavery because that's how the children of Israel got in Egypt so that there was an exodus, and that was all part of God's will. Well, don't think that God was pleased and he architect Joseph, that sin against him. God is not part of sin. He doesn't will sin, and he does not conspire with humans for them to sin. No, God's will is best advanced by obedience. But disobedience doesn't mean that it's lost. But there's scars that come from it. There's evidence, there's pain, there's sorrows, there's hurt that comes from it. And what he's saying here is that which is twisted can't be, be made straight perfectly again. There's going to be evidence. And that which is lacking, it can't be numbered, meaning this. What's lacking, you can never know exactly how to make it whole. Man can't do that. Furthermore, look at verse 16. I have spoken with my heart, saying, I behold I have become great. And I have added, meaning to himself, knowledge or wisdom over all which was before me concerning Jerusalem or over Jerusalem. Now, what he's talking about here is not other kings. No, here again, the rabbinical scholars, most of them, see Jerusalem as a seat of wisdom and knowledge because God's there. And Solomon's saying, more than any other of those people, I'm wiser. I have more wisdom than they do. I am the chief. I have exalted above all of them. And he says, I, my heart has seen much wisdom and knowledge. And what does he say about that? Well, here again. Because he is pursuing it from an intellectual standpoint. To know this world and not know God what does he say? I have given my heart to know wisdom and knowledge. And what is that? He says, Hole lot ve siklut. What's that? Well, it's madness and folly. Now, this is important because when we set our heart to become intelligent, smart, full of knowledge of this world, and we reject God. Now, there's nothing wrong with education. There's nothing wrong with wanting to learn and understand things in this world. But if we leave God out of it, all that knowledge is going to be in vain. We need to see that there has to be a balance as we pursue knowing God. We can also study his creation. And the only way rightly to understand creation is by knowing God. So I'm not against knowledge or studying or being intellectual and pursuing wisdom in this world, in the things such as mathematics and sciences and science and whatnot. But we have to do it under the authority of God, meaning from being submissive to his will, wanting to glorify him and honor him. And Solomon, in this context, what he's sharing with us is this. When we leave God out of it, it's all in vain. 
It brings about madness and folly. Look now at the end of that verse. He says, I have known that also this is, and he changes the words a little bit. He adds one letter. He says, not reut ruach, but he says here, rayon ruach. And what's that? Well, rayon, most Bibles translate it the same way, but it's not the same word. It's the concept. It's an understanding, trying to understand the wind. He's saying none of that. It's futile. When you try to understand the wind, you're not going to have what? You can't figure out the wind. It is going to surprise you. It's going to turn according to what? Well, what does Yeshua say about that, the wind, to Nicodemus in John chapter 3? Now, today, under short periods of time, people can predict the speed of wind, the direction of wind, but you know what? Oftentimes, they're wrong. And anyone will tell you that the wind can change like that. So he says it's futile. Now, some will say it's like chasing the wind. Finally, last verse. When we pursue knowledge and not the knowledge of God, when we want to be wise in our own understanding of the things of this world and we leave God out of it, what's it going to bring about? Look at verse 18. For in much wisdom, there is much anger. Now, as you know, more and more, it's going to frustrate you. Because Solomon is saying, I understand things better than anyone else. And the world frustrates him. The world makes him angry. Because he knows it should be this way, and it's not that way. He knows that people should do this, but they don't do that. And so wisdom, apart from understanding God and his purpose and plan, it is going to make you an angry person. And he says, I have added knowledge to, to what? He says, one who adds knowledge, what does he add? He adds pain. And that's true. The more that you know, if you know, for example, someone, and you know everything about that person, it's going to be a painful experience. Because at times that person, they're going to think things. They don't want you to know that. That may be a thought that they have for a moment. And when you hear that, when you know everything, what if you knew right now the day that you were going to die? And you knew how you were going to die? And you knew things that were going to happen to you in the future that were going to be painful? How would you feel? Well, you know, if a painful thing, a tragedy is going to happen five years from now, you know what? You may live very happily. You may live very contently up until that time. But if you know that, what's going to happen? From today, from the moment you know it until it happens, you're going to be miserable. So knowledge and wisdom isn't the solution. You can know everything. You can have perfect wisdom. And if you leave God out of it, if you don't have a kingdom perspective, well, in the end, you are going to be angry, bitter, and experience that, that inner pain rather than the joy and the satisfaction that God wants you to have from a kingdom knowledge, not knowing that there's a kingdom, but also knowing the king of that kingdom, Messiah Yeshua. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.